by way of announcements today, uh, make sure that you fill out the prayer cards. They're available out on the back table. Place the offering plates or the hand of the ushers, the, the plates back there, and there's some right up here. Uh, did anybody not get communion elements? It's in here already. We'll, we'll bring it down to you. Uh, bring some communion elements down here. Got one here. Thank you, sir. All right. The offering place will not be passed. So place your gifts in the plates in the front and back, as I said earlier. Today will be Sunday school at 1045. Um, this will be through July, and then we'll determine whether or not we'll continue that way or go back to what we originally done. Then there may be a possibility that you got the whole thing down. You never know with what's going on out there. Uh, we will relocate the ABC class in the dining hall. So if you're in the ABC class, you'll be in the dining hall. And the, the youth will be relocated to the library. All right? Um, yeah. Are there any other um, announcements to be made from the congregation? If not, let's have a, a be in prayer and, and ready to serve God through whatever we can do during this time.
the faith, we are going to uh, 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 aim ourselves toward the flags and the Bible this morning as we pledge our allegiance to the American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God.
And we pray for their captors today. That you would change hearts. Lord, your desire is to do it by changing a heart. And so we pray for conversion, Lord. Thank you for what you've done to us in converting us. In giving us a new heart, a heart for God. And again, Lord, thank you for liberty and for freedom. Freedom from sin, freedom from tyranny, freedom to live a righteous life, a holy life, a life that is pleasing unto you. Lord, we just pause for a moment to lift up our side and request before you. Hear us as we pray.
And while they're making their way, I hope you can see the immediate elements. We're experimenting with something today, uh, trying to do it so there's uh, the least amount of touch going on with that. Uh, you, you receive it all in one. Uh, affectionately known as sipping it, I'm not sure. <laughs> but you'll notice that there is the first uh, layer on here, it's a clear one. And you'll be, once we are ready to do it, you'll be peeling that. Don't do it now, but we'll be peeling that off. Bill, you'll find a wafer there so that when we receive the body of Christ, that's what we take. And then carefully peel back then the next level, and that's uh, the, the more, I guess it's purple. Peeling that one back, and you'll discover the juice there for you as we receive the love of Christ. But that'll be coming up following our, uh, our message this morning. We want to sing about the cross right now, though. Recognizing what Jesus has done in setting us free from oppression to sin.
morning comes from the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel, chapter 17, verses 31 through 37. Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine and fight with him, for you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it, and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. The word of the Lord. How's the flock of Grace Church doing? Are you managing? Are you getting by? Are you perplexed when you turn on the news? Isn't it weird? We are living in some strange times, no doubt about it. And we wonder why. I, I wonder why. I don't have any solutions other than we're here now for a purpose. You and I, as the body of Christ, Christ's presence in the world, are here for a purpose. To shine Jesus, to make Him known. Because the world really needs Jesus. It needs it all the time, but when you see what's going on today, you think, definitely today. Definitely today. And you and I, then, get to make a difference. One life at a time. We may not get all together and protest, we may not all get together and press signs together, but we can influence one life at a time, and that will make a difference. It really will. It is important, though, to know our history in the midst of that. Uh, there was once a little boy in his teacher's class who was struggling to learn. And one day the teacher asked him, can you tell me who might have signed the Declaration of Independence? Can you name one signer? He didn't know. And every day the teacher would ask him for a whole week. But still, he didn't have a correct answer. Finally, in desperation, the teacher called up his parents, and, and the father came in to see her. And she said to him, Your son won't tell me who signed the Declaration of Independence. Well, the father said to the son, Come over here, boy, and sit down. And the boy knew he did as his father instructed him. And then the father said, Now, son, if you sign this thing, you just admit it, so we can get on out of here. <laughs> It's important to know your history, isn't it? Well, we're continuing to look at some history of our faith. The, the New Testament tells us that we are grafted into God's family as, as Gentiles. We are grafted in, but become part of God's family. We have that in the New Testament. Which means then that even the Old Testament is part of our heritage of faith, because this is how God started it all, from creation and up to creating a people for himself known as uh, Israel, the Judean people. And so we're referring to that even in our scripture today, kind of carrying on this theme of being people after God's own heart. And it was said that about David, wasn't it? David was a man after God's own heart. It is said that David was a man after God's own heart. What do people say about you? Do they say, Carol is? Or do they say, the set of mind that he is the set of hand that she is the set of Ryan that he What do people say about you? What would you like them to say about you? What would you want them to say that really matters, that makes a difference, that has 
has the opportunity to influence others and make an impact. Well, it's enlightening for us to look at how David was trained by God to go from just being a boy and a shepherd to becoming a man and a leader, the next king in Israel. And the training ground was lonely and unapplauded, was mundane, and yet based in real life experience reality. So we're going to look at four disciplines that God uses to develop our inner qualities. The first one is solitude. Doesn't sound fancy, does it? We're thinking, there's going to be more behind that. It's, it's solitude. And it's where they learn. They need to learn life's lessons alone before he could be entrusted with responsibilities and rewards that he would have in public life. Author and commentator F.B. Meyer described it this way. A Bethlehem is situated six miles to the south of Jerusalem by the main road leading to Hebron, and its site is 2,000 feet above the Mediterranean sea level. On the northeast slope, there is a long gray ridge in the valley on either side. And on the gentle slopes of the hills, there the fig, the olive, and the vine grow luxuriantly. And in the valleys, there are the rich grain fields. The rich grain fields were even once Ruth gleaned and read about her in the Bible. So no wonder that in this place he comes called the House of Bread, Bethlehem, the House of Bread. Now the Mormons around Bethlehem, uh, forming the greater part of the Judean Plateau, uh, do not, however, present features that are uh, beauty and soft, but know they're wild, they're gaunt, they're strong. And their character is bread. Their shepherds have always led and watched their flocks. And it's where David now experiences the knowledge that the natural scenery and the pastoral pursuits will then color all of his life. His writings and how he leads, much like that of a, a, a fat still that stains the, the cloth by his hands. Such were the schools and schoolmasters of David's youth, beginning with solitude. A shepherd passes a lot of time in solitude, but solitude has nurturing qualities all of its own. Take away the crowds. Take away the hustle and bustle, the sounds of the shopping center, the absence of music you can imagine living without your iPod or other device or sounds. Instead of sounds, so they'll overduce death in a person's soul. It's been said that if you can't stand to be alone with yourself, then you have deep, unresolved conflict within your inner spirit. So, when was the last time you got alone with yourself? You kind of unplugged and turned off. Well, some of us have had to do that during this quarantine time and all this, this thing going on. allow yourself to get alone in solitude and you with nature. Do you hear it? Silence. Well, except for the hum of the air conditioner. Aren't you grateful for air conditioning? It's kind of loud But the sounds of silence can be deafening. It also makes for a great song if you're signing up. <laughs> <laughs> Solitude, though. That's where David lived. That's where he first learned to lead, uh, to, to king it, as it were. Countless nights he sat under the stars. He felt the blustery wind of autumn. He felt the cold rains of winter. And knew the scorching heat of the summer sun. Solitude was one of the teachers God used to train young David for the throne. A second discipline. A second area of training is obscurity. Obscurity. God trains his best personnel in obscurity. Women and men of God, servant leaders in the making, are first unknown and unseen and unappreciated. They're unapplauded. Remember, the character is built in obscurity. 
Now that seems strange, but for those who accept it and accept the silence and obscurity, you will be best qualified then to handle the applause of popularity. If you will accept the silence of, of obscurity, you will best be able to then handle the applause of popularity. Perhaps even today you're in a place of obscurity. No one knows your name, no one knows you're there. Maybe you're unemployed and really feeling in obscurity. Or maybe you're underemployed and a dead end job is waiting for the next one to come along. Maybe you're waiting for something. Waiting for a promotion. Waiting to graduate. Or waiting for the next thing. But I want to tell you, where you are now counts. Even in obscurity, it matters. Don't waste it then. Take full advantage of it. Do your best, even there. Now, don't wait for conditions to be perfect because they never will be. Know this, God sees you. He sees you even when no one else does. And that leads to the third treaty route. Monotony. Hmm. Anybody familiar with that? It's a game I know and rather, right? You keep going around, pass up, go to jail. Hopefully you'll land on free parking with all the money in the middle. No. A uh, third grade Sunday school teacher was talking about uh, God's designs for marriage and was asking the class, what's that word that describes the situation of one man and one woman for one lifetime? Some of you guys have to ask the wives, what is that? What is he looking for? What's the right term? Well, one of the boys said, Ah, oh, I know this. My dad says this is not me. <laughs> the correct answer was, not me. <laughs> but monotony, it's a training ground that God uses to shape our character. Spiritually, it means being faithful in the, the meaning, the, the insignificance, the routine, the, the dull, the mundane, the unexciting, uneventful, regular, daily tasks of life. Life without a break. Life without wine and roses. Just every day, plain, dull life. God uses the monotony. I'm told it's a lot like flying. If you're a pilot, I have a college friend who is a commercial pilot. He's been so for 30 years now. And at times he says, I just feel like I'm really a glorified taxi driver. That's all I am. Flying is nothing more than hours and hours of monotony, punctuated by a few seconds of sheer terror. <laughs> but that describes one of God's favorite methods for shaping you and me. Monotony. Although perhaps without the terror, although life can be scary at times. But just the constant, unchanging, endless hours of tired monotony. As you learn to be a woman of God, as you learn to be a man of God. With nobody else around, when nobody else notices, and nobody seems to care. That's how you and I learn also to key it. And then the fourth training ground that God uses to develop our character. Reality. Real life experience. Now up until now, maybe you pictured uh, David, yes, in solitude, obscurity, and monotony, but just sitting out somewhere on a hilltop in a misty cave, right? Contemplating the, the vast wonders of life, writing brilliant pieces of music, or relaxing in the Judean pastures, teaching the sheep to sit, roll over. <laughs> but none of that is true. What was David learning in the midst of that? Well, now let's jump ahead to what Aaron read right for us in 1 Samuel 17. Here is David standing inside Saul as a giant numbers across the distant landscape. You remember Saul, right? The first king of Israel. Chosen because he was tall and handsome and rugged. But now he's scared to death, cowering. His knees knocking. He's hiding his tent from Goliath. And little David, young David, is saying, God's got this. Let's go whoop up on him. Saul looks at him and says, who are you? He says, I'm David. Where have you been? I've been tending my father's sheep. 
But son, you know nothing about war. You know nothing about battle. You don't know how to fight a Philistine. But what did David say? I have been tending my father's sheep. Okay, that's solitude okay. and obscurity. Kind of monotony. And when a lion or bear comes and takes a lamb from, from the flock, that's reality. I went after him and attacked it, and I rescued the lamb from its mouth. And if it rose up against me, I seized it by the beard, I struck it, and killed it. I lead to the dead, don't you? But where did David get such courage? He learned it all alone, but in the presence of God. What kind of young man is this David? Well, he's a man of reality, a real life experience. He's a young man who remained responsible, even when no one else was looking. Goliath was no big deal to David. Why? Because David had already been killing lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. Even when nobody was around. He had been facing reality long before Goliath had showed up. Somehow I believe we've got it all wrong about this thing about getting alone with God. We think it's unrealistic. It's pie in the sky. It's not the real world. Getting along with God doesn't mean sitting in a closet and contemplating your legal bent or the vast things of eternity. Getting along with God means getting with God, talking with God, and discovering how to be more responsible and diligent in all the areas of your life. Whether that means fighting lions or bears or simply following orders. Making your bed, doing your chores, showing up to work on time, following through your tasks. Getting along with God is not standing back and let, let God do anything for you. God has never showed up to fix a flat tire for me. He's never done it. He's never showed up to change the baby's diaper when my kids were young. Or confronted a teammate that I had to confront. Or facing a hope that I had to face. Or confront some other giant in my life. God's never done it for me. He's been there with me. But I've had to do it. And neither did God do that for David. David rolled up his sleeves and he fought for those sheep. And it was in such scenes of reality, along with solitude and obscurity and anomaly, that David learned to be kings. Four things, right? Solitude, obscurity, monotony, real life experience, reality. I want to kind of close things up now by saying there's two lessons we, we learn here. As we see David go from a boy to a man, as, as we recognize God wants to bring us from immaturity to maturity. Here's the first one. It's the little things and the lonely places that we prove ourselves capable of the big things. It's the little things and the lonely places that we prove ourselves capable of the bigger things. Didn't Jesus tell a parable like that? He entrusted three different servants certain amounts of money and said, I'm going away, but you do take care of this for me. For failing all the little things, he will give us more responsibility for greater things. If you want to be a person with a large vision, you must cultivate the habit of doing little things well. Cultivate the habit of doing little things well. That's how God puts iron in our bones. So it means filling out the detailed reports that's required of us. Fulfilling the daily assignment. Completing the tasks at home and dorm life. Doing all this reveals whether we're personally willing and learning to lead, learning to king it. It's the little things and the lonely places that proves our character. <coughs> Number two, when God develops our inner qualities, the Lord is never in a hurry. 
I wish he was. But he is, is he? He takes his time. The late pastor Alan Redpath of Moody Memorial Church once said, The conversion of a soul is God's miracle of a moment, but the manufacturing of a saint is God's task of a lifetime. God is never in a hurry to build our character. So it's in the classrooms of solitude and obscurity that we learn to become a man of God. It's from the schoolmasters of monotony and reality that we become like David and learn to keep it. Women and men after God's own heart. Let me pray for this. Heavenly Father, thank you again for your word. And we want to say, Lord, we want to be people of the authority of your word. If we went by what the world says or what hearsay is, we'd never know anything, Lord. We'd never know what's fact and what's not. We wouldn't know truth from wrong and hearsay from what's absolute. Lord, I thank you for the Bible. I thank you that it has come down from the ages in the forms of Hebrew and Greek and that meticulously it and handed on down, even, even in the former days of writing it out by hand. And when one copy got older, it, it again was handwritten and checked and rechecked and checked again. And it was passed on from generation to generation. Thank you, Lord, that what you want to tell us is in this book, in these pages. Lord, you inspired men and women to write these things down. I don't know if they knew that they were writing the Bible. But we are then so grateful for councils throughout history who have put these things together and said, this is the shape of how God is working in Israel. And this is how things were in Jesus' day and what was happening in that time. Lord, I thank you for the scholarship that's gone into that so that we can trust its reliability today. Lord, I confess that there are many things in the Bible I don't like. I wish that it weren't there. But I know they're there for my good. And so, Lord, help us to be people of your word. And Lord, allow us to then lead these lessons that even David learned. That you often work in the simple tasks, the mundane tasks, the ones that don't receive any applause. And yet we know that you are shaping our character, forming us into the women and men God wants to be. Oh Lord, may we hunger and thirst for more than always. May we never be satisfied with anything that this world can give to us, Lord. But always recognize that. We don't live by bread alone. We don't live by possessions alone. We live by the Word of God. And your Holy Spirit living inside of us.